In our second lesson on the citric acid cycle from chapter 14, we want to look in greater detail at the transition step which converts pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. It's called the transition step because we're transitioning between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. Remember the product of, the, of glycolysis is pyruvate, but the substrate that enters the citric acid cycle is acetyl-CoA, and so we need to convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and we'll do that in this process. As you can see in this figure from your book on the lower right, it's actually a multi-step process. So why do we call it a transition step? We only have one substrate, that's pyruvate on the far left here, and have one product, acetyl-CoA, and so it's referred to as the transition step, although it's actually a multi-step process. In this process, we'll actually see three enzymes involved, so it's a complex of enzymes. The product in one step rapidly becomes the substrate for the next, and so even though it looks quite complex, it happens very quickly. Once pyruvate binds to that first enzyme, it is never released from the complex. It remains tethered to the various prosthetic groups or cofactors and passed from one enzyme to the next. So it's kind of an assembly line production of the final product. You will be responsible for recognizing the three enzymes, their cofactors, and their roles in this process. Here we have step one. It is catalyzed by the first enzyme in this complex, it's simply referred to as E1. The name of the enzyme is pyruvate dehydrogenase, and as you can see, that's where the name of the complex comes from. The only name you need to know in this process is this enzyme, and therefore the name of the complex, pyruvate dehydrogenase. The other enzymes will simply refer to as E2 and E3. So the goal of enzyme 1, or pyruvate dehydrogenase, is simply to decarboxylate pyruvate, and we'll see how that works in just a moment. The cofactor is thiamine pyrophosphate, or TPP, and you can see that illustrated at the top of the screen here. The functional part of this molecule is that thiazolium ring, and notice the red hydrogen atom there is a low, very low pK value for that proton. It readily dissociates into the more functional form of the ring, as we'll see in just a moment. Here we have at the bottom of the screen here the functional form of the thiazolium ring, which involves a carb anion. It will readily attack the carbonyl carbon on the substrate pyruvate. Remember, it carries a partial positive dipole there because of the electron withdrawing oxygen atom. And so this chem chemistry happens very readily. And so now we see that the substrate is actually attached to the cofactor of enzyme 1. Remember, a carboxyl group makes a very good leaving group, and that's where pyruvate gets decarboxylated. And now the form is a hydroxyethyl group, and it's attached to TPP. Notice the negative charge on the product of this step, and that's stabilized by the positive nitrogen atom in the ring of the thiazolium cofactor. So the goal of enzyme 1, its function, is to decarboxylate pyruvate. Now we're ready for step two. Enzyme one is now going to pass that hydroxyethyl group to the cofactor for E2. The name of the enzyme is dihydrolipoyl transacetylase, but E2 is fine with me. As you can see, its cofactor is lipoamide, and that's pictured at the top of the screen here. It's a lipolipoic acid. It's attached to a lysine side chain on the enzyme, so it's a permanent part of the molecule of the uh, protein, a prosthetic group. As you can see, the functional part here, there are two red sulfur atoms, a disulfide bond, and that's going to be key for its function. So here at the bottom of the screen, we have the hydroxyethyl group attached to enzyme 1. It just needs to pass it to that lipoamide cofactor. As it does so, the group becomes oxidized to form now that acetyl group. So this is the first function of E2, and that is to oxidize the hydroxyethyl to acetyl. As you'll notice now, we've broken that disulfide bond. We've oxidized the acetyl group, to uh, the hydroxyethyl to an acetyl, and in the process, we've reduced the other uh, sulfur atom. 
You'll notice the thiazolium ring has returned to its original form, and so now E1 is ready to pick up another pyruvate and start the process again. Now the second goal of E2, now that it's formed that acetyl group is to transfer it to coenzyme A. Coenzyme A ends with this sulfhydryl group and now we begin to see the importance of this lipoamide cofactor and why we needed to make that original attachment. So here's our acetyl group. It's attached to that sulfur atom on the lipoamide cofactor and that makes a thioester bond. We're going to transfer the acetyl from lipoamide to acetyl-CoA and you'll notice we're going to form a new thioester bond. So we're exchanging one thioester bond for another and that's what makes this process possible. That's why we needed that disulfide group on the lipi lipoamide cofactor. So when we oxidized the hydroxyethyl to form acetyl, we conserved the energy of that process in that thioester bond, and now we've just exchanged one thioester for another. These happen in rapid succession. And so now E2 has accomplished its goal. It's oxidized the hydroxyethyl to acetyl, and it's transferred it to acetyl-CoA. But you'll notice now we have a reduced form of that lipoamide cofactor and we need to return this enzyme to its original form where we have the oxidized disulfide bond. And that is the entire role for E3 in our pro uh, process. Dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase, E3 is fine. It's just going to re-oxidize that lipoamide cofactor. It's able to do that because it also has a cis-cis disulfide bond. It also carries an FAD cofactor. So in this process, we're simply going to exchange the redox partners. So here's the reduced lipoamide and the oxidized disulfide in E3, and we're just going to exchange that. So now the lipoamide of E2 has become re-oxidized, and we've reduced the disulfide bond on E3. But of course we have to return E3 to its original form as well, and so we're going to re-oxidize those sulfhydryl groups, and so here's our disulfide bond reformed. As we do that, we're going to oxidize and we're going to extract those electrons. We're going to pass those eventually to NAD plus to form NADH. The FAD cofactor of E3 seems to participate in this process. It probably receives the electrons first before passing them to NAD+. If these were separate cofactors, not as, uh, associated with proteins, the process would usually be the reverse. In other words, the electron flow would normally be from NADH to FAD. But the fact that FAD is associated with a protein makes this possible. This will make a little bit more sense when we get to chapter 15 and look at the flow of electrons. So here's an overview of our process. E1, the goal is to decarboxylate pyruvate and then it transfers it to the lipoamide group of E2. E2's job is to oxidize that to acetyl and transfer that to CoA. And then the job of E3 is to reoxidize the lipoamide and pass those electrons to NAD+. In our next video lesson, we're going to start to look at the citric acid cycle itself and see what the first product is in that cycle. And we'll see that there are also some irreversible steps in this cycle as we've seen in other pathways.